Alright, in this video I'm going over monopolistic competition and in particular we're going to think about the restaurant industry in a particular town, maybe it's a small town, and we're going to look at three different cases. There's the case where there's only three restaurants in the town, Mexican burgers, Chinese food, then there will be the case that's sort of the Goldilocks case where there's the perfect number of restaurants in the town. Um, uh, Mexican restaurant, Indian restaurant, Chinese restaurant, fusion restaurant, burgers, and Tex-Mex. That's the perfect number. And then there's going to be a case where there's too many restaurants in the town and a bunch of them are making losses. <clears throat> We're going to see how with monopolistic competition um, you, ha you lead to a situation with zero profits because um, in this situation with too few restaurants, the restaurants make a bunch of profit um, people get jealous of that profit, so they open their own restaurants to try to get some of that action, and that leads to more restaurants entering. And when we have too many restaurants, um, the companies, a lot of these are making a loss, so they exit the market, they go out of business until we end up with a situation with the right number of restaurants. Now, just to remind you, monopolistic competition has the characteristic that it has product differentiation, so each restaurant has a unique flavor. Um, and has a little monopoly of its own. What differentiates monopolistic competition from monopoly, even though they actually use the same model, is the elasticity of demand. The elasticity of demand with monopolistic competition is more elastic because there are imperfect substitutes that people can go to. Um, the Tex-Mex restaurant cannot raise their prices too high because if they do, people will go have a burger or will go have Mexican instead. So, um, let's get started, and just to remind you, each of these situations is going to have a representative firm that uses a monopoly model. So let's look at the top case first. Alright, we've just zoomed in on the top case. This is a situation where there's three restaurants in town, and this monopoly model will be for one representative firm in that industry. So it's going to have a demand curve, a marginal cost curve, and an average total cost curve. And when we think about the three situations I just outlined, the elasticity of demand will be most inelastic in this case. And I'm going to make it pretty inelastic just to show you um, the difference between the three graphs. So let me set that up. So here we have a monopoly model with a demand curve facing that monopoly, and this might be the Mexican restaurant in that industry. And it's got a marginal cost, we'll just let our marginal cost be fixed, um, which is like the marginal cost of the, the beans and the tortillas, etc. And we know there's an average total cost curve, but I'm going to wait till the end of each of these to add that, just so that we can drive home a point. But right now, let's solve our monopoly model using our golden rule. So let's remind ourselves what the golden rule of economics is. Marginal cost equals marginal benefit is the golden rule in economics. It's going to help us solve this model. Um, so first, we need to find out what our uh, marginal benefit is. And of course, in this situation, it's profit maximization, so the benefit's revenue. So let's find the marginal revenue curve, which we've done in other videos. There we have our marginal revenue, and wherever marginal revenue equals marginal cost, that's going to give us our optimal quantity. And once we've found our optimal quantity, we will set the price as high as we possibly can at that quantity as this mon monopolist, and that's going to be up on the demand curve. So we've found our optimal quantity and optimal price for this monopolist Mexican restaurant operating in a monopolistic competition situation. And now we need to add our average total cost curve. Okay, I've added the average total cost curve, and of course, since our demand curve is really steep, really inelastic, our demand curve is going to go way up above our average total cost curve, um, because of course we're probably going to have a profit in this situation. So let's find our profit or loss box on this diagram. And we can do that by knowing that we're going to sell this many units. Our average total cost accounts for fixed costs and variable costs, accounts for every cost. So if we're producing this number of units, the way to interpret the point on that average total cost curve is um, we're spending 
on average this much money per unit that we produce. Um, and how much are we bringing in, of course? Well, that's going to be our marginal revenue, which is the price for every unit we sell. We bring in uh, this much money. So the profit box is going to be this box here. And again, the reason for that profit box is because we're selling this quantity, it's the quantity we're selling, times how much are we making per unit that we sell, and that's going to be the price of that unit minus the, the cost of producing that particular unit, which is captured in the average total cost curve. So here we're making a profit. We know that firms are going to enter the industry because they get jealous of that profit. And when they do enter that industry, we have more substitutes and closer substitutes available for the Mexican restaurant. For example, we're going to have a Tex-Mex restaurant and an Indian restaurant entering this industry when they see that profit box. And what happens to this diagram when those companies do enter the industry? Well, um, what happens is demand becomes more elastic since there's closer substitutes, that means the demand curve is going to rotate down um, like this, and you might imagine as it rotates down, it might rotate all the way down to where it's tangent to the average total cost curve. So let's look at our Goldilocks situation when firms start to enter until this profit box goes to zero. Okay, so this is going to be our Goldilocks scenario with the six firms in the business, and in which case this is going to be our zero profit situation. We're going to set it up the same. It's still a monopoly model. We will just have a situation where the elasticity of demand is more elastic and it's rotated down a little bit like this. So here we just have the elasticity of demand rotated down compared to the other diagram. Now let's solve this model as a monopoly model as you solve all of these. And so I've solved this monopoly. We've got an optimal quantity and optimal price. Now I'm going to put in the average total cost curve. And for the Goldilocks case, where profits are driven down to zero, that average total cost should be tangent right here. OK, in this case, we have a situation where the profit or loss box is zero. And that we can see the reason for that is this is the quantity we're selling. Um, the revenue for each unit we sell is just equal to the price. The cost of each unit we sell um, when we account for things that are built into the average total cost, which includes the fixed costs, those costs are exactly equal to the revenue. So um, there's no profit and there's no loss. Now, if this seems weird that profit would be equal to zero, um, just remember that when we calculated the costs for the average total cost curve, we included um, the amount of profit, the, the amount of profit we need to pay back the investors and the firm. So that's actually built in a normal profit, which is what we need to pay back the investors so they don't go and put their money in another business, they choose to invest in this business. That cost of paying back our investors is already built into the average total cost curve. So um, it's economic profits are zero and that includes normal normal profits built into the cost structure of the firm. All right, so now let's look at a situation where um, there's too many restaurants in this restaurant industry, and of course we're gonna have a loss when we solve this. Now, of course, when we compare these two graphs, what should happen when a bunch more firms enter this industry is that elasticity of demand should become more elastic, so this thing should rotate down like this, and that's the way I'm going to draw it. So here we have a much flatter elasticity of demand, um, simply because there's a lot of substitutes available. And let's solve this model like we solve all monopoly models. All right, so we've solved this monopoly model, and now let's add our average total cost curve. Now when we compare it to our old perfect Goldilocks case, we know that as firms entered, this demand curve rotated down, became more elastic, that means that the average total cost curve is going to be significantly above the demand curve. So let's draw that. So we've got our average total cost curve and now we just need to find the profit or loss box. And since we have such an elastic demand curve, it's probably going to be a loss box. Um, now we just need to find it. So we know we're selling this many units. 
the revenue per unit is just equal to the price. The cost per unit is equal to this. So we know this amount, the distance between the cost and the revenue or the price, is the loss per unit that they sell. So, so there we have the loss box. Um, in which case firms here are making a loss, some of them will go out of business until we move back up to a situation that's closer to the Goldilocks case where um, profits are zero other than the profits that we're paying back our investors for investing rather than going to their next best option, their opportunity cost. So this is monopolistic competition. We've got our three cases, too many firms, to few firms and just the right amount of firms in the Goldilocks case. And to remind you, we use a monopoly model for uh, monopolistic competition, but there's free entry and exit, which leads to this zero profits in the long run situation. And of course, the elasticity of demand is going to be more elastic since there's um, substitutes um, in monopolistic competition, whereas there's not with monopoly.